um, um, so yeah, you need you need you need quite a bit. Uh, you have quite a bit of overhead to actually maintain these systems. Uh, but yeah, the promise of the cloud is that you just uh, you click the right mouse button uh, 20 times and then you have your Hadoop cluster there uh, without the need for any any engineer. Uh, so currently the big three, so let's say Amazon, Azure, and Google, they have their own flavor of uh, Hadoop distribution. So Amazon has this thing called EMR. I think it's uh, Elastic MapReduce probably. Uh, Azure has AZ Insight, Google has Dataproc. Uh, and then there's a new contender, I'm calling it a new contender, uh, Databricks, which is uh, actually be able to run on both the Azure and the uh, Amazon Cloud. It's like a different take of things. So uh, with that said, let's jump into the first one. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to uh, stop me in between because we're going to basically uh, yeah, jump from distribution to distribution. Well, okay, they have, they have something, obviously, uh, but um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you have to maintain it yourself and it's not, I, I think it's not a true, let's say, uh, uh, managed cloud offering. Intentionally it's intentionally left out. Okay. So EMR. So basically what you do in a, in a typical Hadoop cluster is uh, to be high available, to have it always running, you have two head nodes. Because if one fails, you still have the other one, and you can continue work, right? You fix the, the first one who fa which failed, then uh, you have two again, and you can continue running while one of them fails. So uh, Amazon chose a different uh, setup. So they actually have a single master node. So that's this, uh, this machine there. And then they made the distinction between core nodes and task nodes. So core nodes are actually more or less traditional Hadoop workers. So they, are, uh, they have local storage. And on this local storage, actually, there's a AZFS file system, still very similar to uh, a normal traditional uh, Hadoop uh, uh, installation. But then they also have this concept called task nodes. And those task nodes, they don't have any storage themselves. Uh, they're only doing compute. So they're only using the CPUs to basically crunch on data, but they don't have locality anymore. So that's the first big change you see from the on-premise. Eh? I just mentioned data locality, that was basically one of the key points why we did MapReduce. And now already you see like the first guy, Imar, uh, breaks away from this locality and just says, okay, we're just gonna have compute nodes only. Um, I think why this is, is that uh, for them at least it's, it's more easy, right? They can separate the, the, uh, the disk from the compute. So for them, uh, they have big disk solutions like S3. Uh, all of the platform providers have that, but uh, also since, let's say, the original MapReduce stuff, uh, a new framework was developed, Spark, I think most of you guys know it, and, and what Spark does is it just sucks up all the data into memory and starts computing from memory only. So actually not having storage on your compute might not be as bad as it sounds. So it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's a shift. So all of these nodes can be spot instances. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with spot instances. So those are basically, uh, you can uh, rent an instance from uh, Amazon, which is called a reserved instance, and you get that. And until you don't want it anymore, uh, it's, it's there for you. But with spot instances, uh, you can get like, you can make an offer a bit for instances which are not used at the moment. So you get a big discount, but then at any time, you can just lose the node without any preemptive warning. So this sounds bad, but if you use them for these task nodes, and you, you, for instance, you use Spark, Spark is already designed to be able to handle particular jobs to fail. So if, if a particular node leaves, it doesn't really matter at all. So, Spot instances are a really great way for at least Amazon to save you some money by reducing like up to 80% of your task node cost. 
So, and what you can do as well is uh, you can auto scale uh, this cluster. So let's say you have one data scientist, he kicks off a job, you just heard from uh, the booking guys that uh, if you have a data scientist who maybe not designed the, the query in such a nice way, he will just consume the whole network. But then you have another data scientist also wanting to run his job. If you have an auto-scaling policy in place, you can automatically start scaling more and more and more nodes to be able to handle this big uh, request for compute. So it just adjusts to the, uh, the, the, the demand for a cluster. This actually works quite well. So uh, Amazon by default has this uh, yarn available memory, which basically is quite a good metric to uh, yeah, base your auto-scaling policy on. Um, and it takes 15 minutes to spin. So if I want a, a cluster now, I have to wait 15 minutes, and then I have my cluster. So it's not like uh, weeks and weeks of calling to uh, Dell guys to give me the hardware now. Uh, you can just, uh, 15 minutes, you get, get your cluster. And you actually pay per second. So uh, if, if, if I decide to stop my cluster now, it's gone and I stop paying as well. So you can see that there's, there's also this flexibility in if I actually want to keep this uh, cluster running or not. Because 15 minutes spinning and billing per second. Yeah. Now, yeah, so a core node actually uses this local SSD. So with Amazon, uh, some of these instances, they have a local SSD. I'm not quite sure how local a local SSD is, but I, I can imagine that a local SSD is actually in the, in the machine itself. Okay, let's, uh, let's park that for now. I'm gonna go into that uh, in a bit. Storage. Okay, so uh, what Amazon uh, uh, does is you have HDFS, which is using uh, the storage of the core nodes, but it's not persistent. If I kill my cluster, the data stored on HDFS is gone because it's on the local disk of this core node. So I have to use it in a different way because if I store my booking.com click traffic, it's gonna be gone if I kill my cluster. So what do you do? With, you use it for you use it as scratch, right? So um, uh, while running the job, you might use it to save some data on it. Uh, but when it's finished, you have to move it to a more, more permanent destination, being S3. So S3 is basically the the source and your destination of all your jobs, yeah? because if you put it on ICFS again, it's it's gone. Um, but S3 actually has this problem, which is called read after write consistency. So if I write something into S3 and I read it like one second after, I'm, I'm most probably gonna get the old version which is still there. So how Amazon dealt with this is they, they actually made this thing called S3FS, which is like a combination of S3 together with this Dynamo, which is a key value store to be able to detect that I'm still reading the old version Pull it, trying and trying and trying again until I get the actual version and then returning. It's, it's magical. So third bullet point. So S3 shards your data automatically uh, based on your full path. So uh, in S3 you have this concept of uh, folders, but it's actually fake. So all files are just, yeah, it's just a full file path only. Um, and S3 shards your data automatically based on the first four characters of this path. So if you start your path with a, let's say, I don't know, clickstream data slash data, uh, then everything is gonna be on a single shard and you're, you're not gonna get the full performance of, a, of your S3 bucket because it's a single shard basically. So if you wanna work around this, you have to do something yeah, magical. So basically what, what you do is you, you add like a, like a random prefix to your, to your uh, data, uh, which allows you to shard, and you then not use it in the, in the, in the table itself. Let's say, for instance, a hive table, you point it towards this uh, particular folder, and then uh, you have like a R variable, which is basically a random signal used to shard. Or alternatively, 
It's also a frequently op uh, a used option. You become friends with one of the Amazon uh, sales guys. You call him every once in a while to shard your data. <laughs> So there's a, there's a button internally somewhere in, uh, in Amazon. They don't like to push it, but it, they can actually uh, shard your data for you. <laughs> okay, so final uh, uh, thing, it's, it's not that big of a deal. So you can uh, use an external Hive uh, Metastore. So Hive, uh, it's like your fake database for big data. Uh, you can uh, use uh, an external database to be able to uh, throw away your EMR cluster and still have access to all the metadata stored inside the Hive Metastore. Everybody does this, so it's not a big uh, pre. So security-wise, no Kerberos. But then again, also Booking doesn't have Kerberos, so uh, who cares? <laughs> I, I would consider it a bad thing, but uh, okay. Um, the web interfaces are bound to the master node, and they're listening to the to the machine itself. So they're not exposed to the internet; they're just local uh, machine only. So if you want to access all of the Hadoop web interfaces, I have to SSH into the machine, and basically you have like a dynamic SOX proxy to access it. It's not a big deal, but you have to uh, yeah, work around it. And then basically you give your EMR cluster. You give it a particular role, and this role can access data, which means any user who can log into this particular EMR instance can access that data as well. So if you share, if you allow multiple users to access a particular EMR cluster, all those users are going to be able to access the data. And they're going to use the same EMI role. Eh? So auditing on S3 level is just going to show this one EMI role accessing data. So auditing is probably going to be a bit tricky. Something else which is tricky. External tooling. So back into the, the initial introduction I gave. So you have um, uh, this edge node. On this edge node you have some tooling. This tooling you use to access the data. For instance, a uh, very popular choice for data scientists is JupyterHub. Um, if you want to make JupyterHub work with EMR, it's doable, but it's tricky. So how we did it is, uh, okay, l let me first explain why it's tricky. So uh, you remember this S3FS uh, library or fix Amazon made? So they have it internally on their EMR machine, but they don't let you download it from somewhere. But if you want to use S3, it's really nice to also have access to that particular library. And how to get it is to actually uh, write this uh, post init script from the cluster. So your cluster boots, then you run a particular script. The script makes a tar of all your libraries, including the S3 one. You copy it through S3. <laughs> then you spin a VM where you're going to install your tooling, and you download this, this tar file you just created. And you extract it locally, and you have access to the same libraries. So it's wor it works. Yeah, it works fine, as long as uh, the version stayed the same, and uh, there's some corner cases there. Um, but yeah, it's it's a bit tricky to do. So summary. I would say EMR is a single user cluster, or at least a single user group cluster, eh? because everybody you give access to that cluster can access all the data it has access to. The outscaling is nice. Uh, you can use spot instances to reduce cost. Uh, but be prepared to deploy slash destroy your clusters because this single head node will fail, and we've seen it failing. Uh, like I said initially, uh, if it fails, your, your cluster just dies. Um, and it also doesn't recover, so it just stays dead. You have to manually remove it, and it's mama Um And maybe this external tooling I just mentioned might be a bit too tricky to be worth the effort. Uh, Depending on your use case, maybe you want to save on cost. I don't know, but uh, yeah, it's quite a cumbersome uh, thing. Uh, no, I don't think so. So what they what they do? They they package I think UE. They package themselves, and uh, you can SSH into the head node and then go into UE. So there you can actually, yeah, do some something similar. But yeah, UE is not the same as uh, Jupyter Hub, let's say. Uh, 
Okay. Yeah. No. No. But then, then again, Zeppelin is also maybe not the same again as. Uh, So next one, next contender. So AZ inside. Starts off quite well. So we actually have two head nodes instead of one. So HA is a possibility at least. And then we have one worker node at least. Yeah? But you can have multi more than one. So what AZ inside does is it's based on uh, HDP, so Hortonworks data platform. It's like a badly configured variant of it. Um, and it has a lot of different types to choose from. So it has your traditional Hadoop, HBase, Spark, and so for instance, HBase and, and Kafka and R, they just spend some additional components next to it to be able to use. Scaling is possible, similar to uh, EMR, but it's not so auto, so no automatic scaling. You have to use your the CLI or this really nice uh, checkbox fill, I don't know, thing in the, in the portal. And uh, somewhat similar to, uh, to the Amazon case, it takes up to 20 minutes to spin, but you're going to have billing per hour. So uh, you're going to do short jobs. Uh, I looked it up today, they didn't. Um, yeah, they have it for some, but not for um, the inside yet. Probably it's going to be released next week, yeah? but still. Um, uh, probably, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. I stand corrected then. Bills per minute. Um, yeah. Yeah. I know that they changed it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Then it's billing per hour. It's a bit uh, less uh, tricky. But uh, like it was, let's say, then in Amazon, let's consider that case. Um, billing per hour is actually quite tricky. So if you do a lot of jobs and you scale the, you sc deploy clusters uh, with a script automatically and you pay per hour and it's only short jobs, then maybe you have to combine jobs into a single cluster to be cost efficient. So if you're always paying for an hour and you're only using eight minutes, yeah, you're still paying for the hour. So Azure took a different approach to the storage problem. So like I said, they, they don't have local storage on the machines, but they have emulated uh, HDFS with this thing called the, uh, we call it the WASBOC connector, but it's uh, WASB. <laughs> um, and basically this WASB connector is backed by a blob store or a data lake store. So the difference is a blob store is like your typical S3, but it has a fixed amount of IOPS, so it has a fixed throughput. Um, if you exceed that, then yeah, you're going to be limited. Uh, this data lake store is like this ultimate scaling thing. Uh, so there's a slider in which you can uh, uh, determine the performance. Um, one way to go around that is more expensive. Oh, sorry, that was a missing part. Um, but you can mount multiple uh, of these WASBs to a single cluster. So depending, uh, more or less, th this is like the site XML. Uh, and you, you basically define the different, uh, yeah, the different connections to the different uh, uh, blob storages. Again, similar to uh, EMR, no Kerberos. Uh, you get this HTTP proxy, uh, which secures all web interfaces, so you get it for free. Same user as you use to log into, uh, let's say, Ambari, which is included in uh, Hortomarks. But they have this variant, which is called AC Inside Premium, and actually has AD integration. But then you don't get Spark. You don't. You only have to use. Uh, you can only use blob storage, and it's in preview mode, which probably means that it's broken in some way you you can't envision beforehand. <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah, it has uh, Kerberos and the Active Directory integration. Yeah. So that that's more or less how you uh, would want to do this. Um, so connecting to external uh, tooling, it's better, but still tricky. Uh, so what you can do is, uh, in the Microsoft space, you have this thing called ARN templates. It's basically your typical uh, templating uh, language. And you can specify that it spins an empty node for you. Uh, and this empty node is like a, like a VM, uh, which has the connection to the cluster already. Uh, and you can run 
let's say, post installation uh, bash script on it. So in this post installation, you install your tooling. So you do your wget, uh, Jupyter Hub, uh, everything else. But also for this tooling, you get the HTTP pro proxy for free. So even uh, even though you might want to uh, link uh, Jupyter Hub uh, to the Active Directory, uh, you still get this uh, login for this HTTP proxy first. You log in there. You click OK. You get the Jupyter Hub uh, login. You log in there again, and uh, so it's not so nice. Uh, but you can get around it with some scripting. Uh, it's a bit tricky. I wouldn't advise it, but uh, basically you can query which internet fa inter interfaces this cluster has and then uh, bypass the proxy altogether. Uh, I did it. I don't think you should. Um, so as a summary, a uh, single user, single group, uh, user cluster, uh, no Kerberos again. Watch those IOPS, uh, the blob store is going to, uh, yeah, if you have more than a couple users, it's going to bite you. And external tooling is better, but still a bit meh. So. No, it's going to cap cap the I.O. throughput. So it's kind of, uh, yeah. if you have multiple jobs running, you can, at some point you can just scale nodes infinity, but yeah, the performance is not going to be better because it's going to be limited by the I.O. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Tim. It's going to be tricky, Tim. Oh God, it's going to mess up my head. Oh, awesome. All right, so Databricks. Um, so we've heard uh, Amazon, we've heard Azure. We will hear about Google. Uh, Databricks is kind of different, as in it's not necessarily cloud that provides you certain services, but it connects to a cloud to do stuff for you. Um, mostly, if you're not using Spark, don't use Databricks, because Databricks per definition is a sort of a Spark managed service. If you want to use Spark, Databricks is quite nice because it handles booting clusters for you. It provides you with external toolings that you don't have to install. Um, so let's get, just get started with the basics. Um, I've used Databricks in combination with AWS, so with Amazon. And for that, you kind of can configure a cluster to have one or more master nodes. Usually you set two master nodes. You can have zero or more worker nodes. Why zero? Because you can have long living clusters and you can basically downscale it to zero workers when in the night you're not running anything. So it costs less. Everything can be spot instances. And as Niels explained, they can be pretty great because they're quite cheap. Uh, you can mix them in any way possible. You can have four spot, six non spot, whatever you like. Um, it auto scales, just like EMR does. Uh, therefore, you can have zero or more worker nodes. Um, the big thing that Databricks provides, though, is collaborative work uh, notebooks. So most of you probably are familiar with something like Jupyter or Zeppelin. So Databricks has its own solution that, for me, it looks a bit like Zeppelin. Um, but it's a notebook that basically can connect to uh, one or more clusters. So a notebook is not bound to a cluster. You basically, you can write your code there. It can be either Scala, Python, Java, or R. It can be in a single notebook, if you like. All of them connect to the same cluster, so on the fly, you can do something in, in Scala, then switch to Python, pull everything to Pandas, do some plotting, then go back to Scala. No problem. Uh, this works because everything connects to uh, a single Spark uh, driver. And the funny thing is you can actually work simultaneously in the same notebook. So once you log in to a notebook, you can see someone else working on it. And you can collaboratively work on a notebook, which is pretty great. Um, you can either choose for interactive clusters. It's a notion that uh, Databricks uses for long living, for short living clusters, sorry, long living clusters, which means that you spin it up, you let it run for a few months for the data scientists to do their work on. Uh, to do some reporting, you can create reports with the notebooks itself. Um, you can basically let it live as long as you want. In the night, it'll downscale to zero nodes, so it'll be cheap. 
uh, you can have short living clusters that use the same building as Amazon does, except for Databricks as a service, so you have to pay for the service. They have this thing called DBUs, which are Databricks units. So you pay for uh, basically per second billing for these DBUs on top of your usual Amazon costs. Uh, the good thing is that they spin ridiculously fast. So if you don't use any spot instances, so on-demand nodes, it can spin in two to three minutes. I've seen it working, so we've usually used Airflow to schedule some clusters, to so basically boot up clusters, do jobs, then shut down the clusters. We've seen it spin up in four-ish minutes using about 80% spot nodes. So, pretty nice. So this is an example of uh, such a notebook. Uh, you can do plotting like you can do in Zeppelin or in Jupyter. Uh, most of the plotting is built in. I mean, you can use the, the built-in plotting. Since everything you run, I mean, everything you run is a Spark job, which means everything that's outputted is some sort of a table, and on a table you can do plotting. You, can, uh, you have several options. You can do a, a time series, a scatter plot, a bar chart, whatever you like. Uh, you can even, if you like, you can run, write SQL here, which is basically the, your uh, Hive SQL, if you like. It'll still compile down to Spark code and run on Spark. Um, works pretty great. So, in terms of storage, uh, they have a concept called DBFS, which is the Databricks file storage. It's kind of a layer over S3, if you use it in combination with AWS. Um, and natively, if you, if you have a, a, data, a Databricks subscription, it'll use its own DBFS storage. So if you have sensitive data, they allow you to mount your own S3 bucket and your own AWS account. If you don't specify it, they use their own. So be careful if you configure that. Um, it can read and write from, well, basically anything that Amazon provides, so S3 buckets. Uh, so if you, your Spark job is done, just write to some S3 bucket. Or you can use an external Hive Metastore. It's pretty much similar to EMR. So, yeah, do we need tooling? The notebook that they offer is quite nice. You don't need to install another notebook. Um, the notebook itself has version control. Working with Git, however, is a bit cumbersome. So if you want to version control your notebooks with Git, you have to do a bit more work. Uh, they provide a thing called the DBFS command line tool which allows access to everything that is stored on DBFS, as if it's not stored on S3. And they have a full REST API that provides cluster management, user group management. Uh, you can basically do anything from there. You can spin up clusters, you can shut down clusters, you can view how your jobs are working. So if you want to have some sort of uh, service with, uh, that does something like this, like we did with Airflow, so we started up a cluster from Airflow, we submitted the job to, to the API, and in the end, we monitored if the jobs were finished by using the job uh, REST API. And afterwards, we basically shut down the cluster using all of this. So you can basically manage everything in a single Python script. So um, a user can spin up a cluster that he has only access to. But a user can also spin up a cluster that multiple users have access to. So you can choose to have a multi-user or a single user cluster. Um, as with EMR, if you give multiple users access to your cluster, they all have access to all the data that is living on the cluster. Uh, luckily, you can configure the clusters to say which data they should have access to. Uh, you can bootstrap clusters. It is a bit annoying, but you can do it. So let's say you want to run some fancy uh, PySpark job that needs some sort of Python dependencies. You can basically say, hey, uh, on all these nodes, I want to have these dependencies installed from pip or anything else. As I said, the notebooks are pretty damn awesome. Um, there's a free Databricks subscription you can, uh, you can get if you just sign up. I would really advise you to play around with it. Try it uh, if you like to dabble around in these data scientist things. But if you need to update dependencies, for example, if you have written this amazing library, and you want to uh, inject it into the cluster, 
you have to restart it. As in, whereas in with Jupyter, you don't have to. As I said, working with Git is a bit tricky, but it has internal version control. So I think that's about it at Databricks. So as I said, it's a bit different. It's not really a cloud provider. It's a notebook provider, and it manages Spark classes for you. Then I'm going to hand over to Constantine. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I should give you this thing. Uh, there you go. Yep. And the rest of this thing, if you like, you can walk around. All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, Google's uh, variation. It's called Dataproc. Uh, when you spin it up, by default, you get one master node. Uh, if for some reason you want three because you want a high available, highly available cluster, it can also do that. Um, that's only if you're using long-lived clusters, which I normally don't, but if you want to, you have an option. Why I don't, I'll get to that later. Uh, and also spins up workers, as many as you want. It, uh, usually it wants at least two. And you can get more if you want. Uh, data, uh, Dataproc is uh, standard Apache Hadoop based. So basically you get, if, if you just go to the Hadoop site and you download it there, you install that, that's the same thing that Google gives you, which means you can uh, run out of the box, you can uh, run Hadoop, Spark, PySpark, uh, Hive, Pick, and Spark SQL. Uh, everything else, it's still a standard Hadoop installation, so you can add extra tools on it if you want, but this is what it does out of the box. Um, you can scale on the go, so even after you've already started a Spark job and you're like, hmm, this is a bit slow, let, let me throw some extra machines on it, uh, you can, but you still need to actively tell it to uh, spin more machines. Uh, by the way, Google has also has a, a service called Dataflow, uh, which runs Apache Beam code, and then you don't need clusters at all. It's just... Uh, go run my code and Google will figure out, okay, let me spin up this many uh, machines to do it. And oh, hey, here's more work, do some more machines. And oh, the last bit is easy, so spin down again. Um, but you need to be coding Beam and not Spark for that one. Um, like the other uh, cloud providers, uh, like AWS uh, has spot instances, but they gave, give you up to an 80% discount depending on the time of day, st stand of the moon, whatever. Uh, Google just gives you a straight up 80% discount uh, if you want uh, machines that live up to 24 hours. Uh, and one of the very nice things is that uh, you're you're, you have your clusters in about a minute and they have per second billing. So that allows you to basically spin up your clusters on demand. Like we heard from Booking, one of the problems is like if you have uh, only have a single cluster and you have multiple people trying to run jobs on that cluster, uh, you have uh, scheduling issues. What if your cluster spins up in a minute? That means you can just give everyone their own, give every job their own cluster if you want to. Like. I'm, uh, I also use Airflow for scheduling, like I hope a lot of you uh, are used to it, but like every job I use on Airflow, if I want to, I can just give all of them their own cluster. Because like, yeah, if I run three clusters in parallel or one cluster three times as long, it costs me the same thing because it has per second billing. Uh, so that's also why I almost never use HA clusters because uh, I just, I, I basically use my Hadoop Spark clusters like I use coffee cups from the, from the coffee machine, uh, the paper cups. So just grab one, use it, throw it away, grab, and grab another one. Uh, storage, uh, there's a service called Google Storage. Uh, it, on the, it kind of looks like S3. Um, but uh, one of the nice things, it has... Uh, more IOPS than your credit card can handle. I've seen experiments that, that went up to 13,000 machines on the thing and uh, it still wasn't, uh, still wasn't hitting any limits. So uh, I'm not sure who here was planning to throw more than 30,000 machines at, uh, at their data, but 
you'll be fine for a while. Also, it, uh, like with EMR, it has some read before write issues that uh, EMR has with S3 has read before write issues that you have to kind of be aware of and work around. Google storage is just immediately consistent. And uh, one of the main things I like about it, it, it just works and it doesn't give me any headaches. Um, and uh, again, um, Google storage is where you leave your data um, when you're, you're spinning your clusters up and down. Like cl clusters come and go pretty fast, but you leave your data in Google storage and that's persistent. You mean Google Drive or? No. Uh, Google Storage is basically, it, it, it allows you to, it's basically a blob storage that allows you to just flat files on there. And they have uh, a couple other variations like Bigtable, BigQuery and whatever, but those are more structured. Uh, Google Storage is just like, hey, here's a collection of bytes and hold it for me. It's immediately consistent. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> um, so for the security wise, uh, Google has, uh, has uh, two types of credentials. They have Google accounts, which is basically the same thing you, you use to log into your Gmail. And they have service accounts, which is, uh, is basically, it's, it's a file that contains a certificate. And you can uh, use those to talk to your cluster. So uh, Google has a command line wrapper around things like Spark Submit. So you can use uh, command line uh, tools that are similar to Spark Submit to uh, send your jobs. And that also means that if you have audit logging and stuff, uh, you will see uh, which user started which job. Um, it also has a REST API, which allows you to fit with the same type of credentials. If for some reason you're, you, you want to code and you prefer to uh, you w use a REST API rather than a command line, it uh, does the same thing. And um, also uh, Google Dataproc uh, spins up VMs for you. And if you have the correct permission, you can get into, into those VMs. So uh, if you really, really want to for some reason, you can uh, get, get into those VMs, use SSH tunnels, VPNs, or whatever you can do because you, it's still a basic uh, 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 Apache Spark cluster that's just running on VMs. So you, if you, you can get at it. Uh, so if you want to do something exotic, you can, but... Uh, yeah, it's lots of work yourself and it's something extra that can break. So if you uh, can avoid it, I would, but it's there if you really need to. Uh, external tooling, uh, one of the most common uh, external tools that people want to use is a notebook server. Uh, Google Cloud uh, offers those, those as a service. So you can just say, give me a notebook and uh, the size of machine and it will spin up a notebook for you, notebook server for you on the specified machine size, which is pre-configured to access uh, the other Google data services. Um, and also it puts uh, your notebooks you work with, it put also puts those in Google storage for you. So if you throw away the notebook service, and then later start a new one, it still has your notebooks, uh, which is really nice. Um, if you need some custom software on your cluster, you can uh, do, uh, on start, you can pass startup scripts. So pip install my thing if you need some, something from pip. And they also have a couple uh, out of the box examples which uh, spin up often used uh, things like your own, if you want your own Jupyter for some reason, you can. Um, and again, uh, like for external tooling, it's, it's still a, just an Hadoop cluster and you, get, and you can get at it with, VM, with other VMs in the same Google Cloud instance, VPN or an SSH tunnel, if you want your own external tooling to do whatever you want to do. Again, I'd, I'd recommend using the uh, cloud services, if any at all possible, 
because it's just much easier and yeah, le less moving parts, so less likely to break. But if you want to, you still can. Uh, so that's uh, this slide. I'd also like to show a small demo. So uh, this is uh, where I want to create a cluster. I can uh, I can give it a name. Uh, I want it in Europe somewhere. Uh, the master is fine with a four core. I'll give it uh, one master because that's fine. I don't need a lot of disk. Uh, I'll give uh, two standard worker nodes. They also, they don't need a lot of disks, and but I'll make these eight core machines, and like the preemptible machines, that's uh, that's the ones that with an 80% discount. I'm gonna want 125 of those. This is the uh, visual com uh, the visual UI for humans, but lots of people also want to script this or do Airflow type stuff with it. Um, so they have options here for. Uh, the equivalent rest call or the equivalent command line. So this is really nice uh, when you're making airflow jobs. Uh, you can just give the command lines. So now it's spinning up a cluster. I don't know if everybody uh, saw this, but this is a 125 node cluster. Uh, not One. your typical uh, on-prem uh, yeah. stuff, right? Yeah, we're going to have uh, like uh, over, ta over 1,000 CPUs on there by the time it's up and running. So over here you can just see a list of uh, VMs that are spinning up. Uh, this is the master nodes, it's already up. So again, uh, you can SSH into it, you can do it with the normal command line or they have basically an SSH session in a browser. Again, if your permissions are set correctly, that you want to, because you don't want, might not want everyone uh, just jumping in your clusters. Uh, so, but there's also a permission set for this. And it's a live demo, so for some reason it's taking longer than usual. A company credit card. <laughs> but like if one thing that, that really helps is uh, if you, you can, uh, there's like the, the 125 machines, there's an 80% 80, 80 discount on those. So that really helps. And also if you don't let, uh, if you uh, immediately throw them away, like I've done this, I've done this demo multiple times. Uh, I used to have a one terabyte data set that I live processed, in a, but that's a, whole, that's a whole talk. So I won't go through that because that takes too long. But in 45 minutes, I can handle a couple. I can spin up a cluster, ha handle a couple terabytes, and throw away the cluster, and a few more things. Um, but like now, I have an SSH session into my cluster. Um, so if, uh, yeah, again, like I said before, if there's things you want to do over here, uh, you can. Uh, you can. better. Like you can even just run an old-fashioned Spark shell in here. Like again, I'm not sure why you would want to, but you can get at your cluster and in if you want to do uh, weird edge cases, you can. Uh, this is SSH in a browser window, but you can also do a real SSH uh, session. But like, they have bo they support both. You, I can I can SSH into whichever node I want because it's. Yeah. Okay. So. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the boils down back to the traditional thinking. Uh, so uh, back in the days, we had on on prem. By the way, it's up now. We have a thousand uh, CPU cluster up and running. <laughs> uh, but back in the day, we did on prem. Yeah, you had the, the head nodes, and the head nodes needed a big memory because they had a full index of AGFS in memory, right? And if you started to load those machines, then probably your uh, this index or your name node would fall over and uh, mayhem. But now, because all these file systems are fake anyways, there's no such thing as a name node anymore. Probably still one there, but it's, it doesn't need more memory because there's no HDFS. So why would you need the full index in memory? So the head node in, in the, all of these uh, cloud-based Hadoop distributions, you, you typically don't need big memory there. And you can even use them for yeah. this sort of stuff. By the way, the cluster was up and running in just about a minute, but because we were talking, it took a little bit longer. I'm also now going to throw it away again, because this, uh, again, 1,000 CPUs does burn through money in quite a bit, in quite a hurry. I was thinking about the company, yeah? <laughs> Oh, by the way, like uh, everyone that uses this um, at some point, usually after it goes wrong, ends up writing some kind of Reaper script, like list all the clusters I have running if it hasn't done anything useful for half an hour, and it's not a data scientist cluster, or it's outside of office hour, kill this, kill this thing. Uh, that's going to pay itself back definitely sooner or later, <laughs> probably sooner. Um, but now it's throwing it away again, and uh, in a little bit it will be gone again. So this was uh, like uh, spinning up a thousand CPU, thousand sixteen actually CPU cluster, and now it's going going down again. That's it, right? Yep. Uh, talk, and I did it three times just to make sure to prepare it where I handled a couple terabytes of data, and that was about 10 euros for the whole thing uh, every time I wanted to process a terabyte of data. Can you, uh, I don't want to reach in your pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, concluding. Um, so, all of them, they provide a, like an on-demand cluster, right? We've seen that. In the extreme case, even where uh, uh, Constantine just pinned this uh, Google uh, cluster. Um, so EMR and AZ Insight are somewhat slower, uh, still minutes, uh, like 15, 20 minutes instead of the one or two minutes for the, the first two. Um, so maybe you want to, uh, if you if you really want to go uh, full blown. Uh, spin clusters on demand, really go for it. Uh, Dataproc and Databricks might be the better solution for you because of this low, much lower latency. Um, then uh, if you want to have like a managed on-site um, uh, cluster in the cloud, uh, I think AZ Insight Premium will probably be the best solution. Uh, it has HA. Uh, like AGG Insight, but it also has the Active Directory integration, so you get much better security. You get some some better auditing, at least, than just the security you get for your typical cloud platform. Eh? A bit more than everybody who can access can access all the data. Um, so yeah, the, uh, more or less is, uh, the next point. So you will have security at the cluster level. So yeah, everybody who can log in can probably access all the data that the cluster can access. So this might or might not work for you. And you have to, uh, <laughs> I see the, the cameras uh, videoing uh, Constantine. <laughs> Still working. Um, so, um, but this, this only month uh, uh, way of working is a, is a radical shift. Huh? You need to think differently and act and be uh, in, uh, inter uh, yeah, integrate with these clusters differently than we did in the traditional on-site uh, way, right? You just spin new clusters for every job, like uh, Constantine was just mentioning. Eh? You have an airflow job, it gets its own cluster. Why would you care about queues and fair scheduling and everything else if you just spin a new cluster and just, eh? why, why do deal with all that hassle? Um, but having more than one cluster, or uh, probably bigger corporations have more than one cluster, but having really many, many, many clusters, how are you going to deal with the management of that? Eh? 
if you're going to have one for each user and you have a couple thousand uh, data scientists working for you, uh, how are you going to do all this auditing and this? Uh, how, how are you going to make make sense of all this mayhem? So think about that. And also, uh, I think the the Databricks solution is really nice. Uh, it integrates really well with this new on-demand way of working with Hadoop clusters, but the open source tooling is not ready yet. Uh, you can connect a Jupyter to uh, Spark context, but what I would like to ha do is uh, run this particular cell on a cluster, uh, and if it's done, just throw away the cluster again. And uh, at a much finer level than just calling get Spark context at the top of my notebook and booting something, I want to have uh, more fine grained control over this booting and shutting down of clusters, and that's not there yet. Also, what you saw with, uh, with the tricky part of the integrations. Uh, how are we going to manage all these config files, copy these libraries through S3 onto a Jupyter machine? It's, it's not really there yet, I think. So that really sh uh, yeah, makes, a, makes a good case for the Databricks solution. Well, that's actually it. I forgot the hiring slide. Uh, I'm going to do it manually. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Oh, just a little, just, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, uh, booking, uh, yeah, we're going to the Driven. We're a group of uh, fun engineers and data scientists, 30 uh, in total, and we're always hiring. So, if you want to uh, burn some money of our company credit cards and uh, spin some clusters in your free time, you're more than willing to, uh, to apply, and uh, thank you uh, for your attention. So, any questions, Robert? So, it seems like the Dropbox solution to Dropbox is a second to Linux. Uh, it's easier to have tooling, and you get both of one out of the box. Is there a situation where you don't want to lock a cluster, or you'd rather go for Amazon than Jetpack? I think uh, maybe uh, the hippo uh, more or less solves it. Huh? So, uh, I think uh, from a technical point of view, Probably Google is the best out of the bunch. I like the integration with Databricks. Uh, so if you're really into the, let's say, data science workflow, then Databricks may be even better than, uh, than Google at this moment. Uh, but yeah, sometimes there's different people in the organization deciding the cloud uh, pro uh, provider. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're bound to a particular cloud. Uh, huh? I know uh, Microsoft has uh, Active Directory. That's always a big plus to convince people to uh, run on Azure. But then again, eh, so now... Um, Who integrates with Azure with Active Directory just fine? Uh, okay, but um, uh, you, don't, you don't have to convince me. Eh? That's, uh, that's, uh, um, but then again, there's, there's rapid development in this space. Uh, now Google is maybe a bit better. Uh, Amazon uh, maybe will do something in the next month, and uh, everything will change again. So yeah, you, you, yeah, it doesn't. In the end, I'm not sure if it matters that much. Any more questions? No more questions. Uh, oh, one, one. Uh, okay, so, yeah, but I, I think that, that uh, okay, you said, uh, uh, what about petabytes of data, are you going to pay a lot? Um, I think that's true for all cloud services, right? Once you cross a critical threshold yet again, then maybe on-prem makes sense again. Eh? Why, uh, I think for uh, the somewhat larger corporations in the Netherlands, in the Netherlands uh, it's hard for them to find the people to manage these Hadoop clusters, but... Uh, yeah, for the booking case, probably you have a couple guys who are more than qualified uh, to manage Hadoop clusters. Well, so I asked because of the question earlier, like why does booking not move to the cloud? And so I would ask you the same question. Do you think we should? And if so, which Okay, so I think it would solve some of your problems. Eh? Like uh, the things with the scheduling, that's yeah. clearly solved here. Um, but yeah, the data, it's going to bite you. Yeah, that's for sure. 
can uh, get it down to ten dollars per terabyte per month. So that's still still ten k per per petabyte per month, um, which is not not cheap. But then again, doing a, doing a couple petabytes on tram is also not cheap. Um, but something like in the Google solution, another service is called uh, BigQuery, and um, uh, putting all your data for uh, ad hoc queries in there, and uh, that's basically a cluster that's already up and running uh, with a couple, couple tens of thousands of nodes below it, and you can just uh, fire queries at it. And okay. So can this thing also fire BigQuery? Can I use the data that's in there, can I use that as a source for... Uh, but what, what I usually end up doing is my raw data in Google Storage because that's just bytes, a collection of bytes, and I uh, run that through Spark in Datacroc and I put that in BigQuery. And also if you want to be a bit more advanced, you can set up a streaming job, uh, uh, set up a streaming job where just things you put things on the queue and it goes and it ends up in BigQuery. But, uh, uh, but, uh Okay, so uh, a big there's a big use case for BigQuery. I'm not sure if this is the one, because you're going to pay per query. $5 per terabyte project. Yeah, but if you're, if you're doing ad hoc analytics, and you want to have like a really scalable fast, uh, maybe not so fast, but quite fast, uh, over big volumes of data, then probably BigQuery is the way to go. If, you, if you're looking for file storage, then BigQuery <coughs> is not the way to go. Okay, I want to thank you all for coming. Uh, we can have uh, some more drinks at the bar, and then uh, I think in uh, like uh, half an hour I'll uh, kick you all out. Yep. Thank you. <laughs>